Welcome to Rain Soak Britain. Luckily, we're not hanging around here for too much longer. We've got a special mission over the next couple of days to head to the Porsche Museum in Germany to collect a friend's 959 from Porsche Classic. Our weapon of choice to get there, support vehicle for the repatriation is the 992 Turbo S. 205 mile an hour, brand new super sports car from Porsche. It will involve an autobahn high speed run, so we'll test that out get the 959 back before all of the coronavirus restrictions in Germany come into force. Plenty can go wrong. Hopefully everything will go right. Best get a move on and find out exactly how this is gonna play out. I suppose I've underplayed that intro a little bit really, haven't I? A friend of mine, Paul, it's his 959 Comfort. It's been back to Porsche Classic in Germany for a service. It's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful example of, nine, of 959, it has to be said. Beautiful. Yes, as I said, it's a really lovely example of the 959. It's one of the eight or nine cars that were made in 1992 as we'll get onto a little bit later on in the video, but it has an exemplary history file to its name. So I guess the whole mantra is keep that going. Porsche Classic know the car really well, so it makes sense for them to take the car back and get the service done. The service has been done and completed in the past few days. It's now up to us to go and, as I say, repatriate the vehicle. Now this is filmed uh, at the end of October, so we're in a kind of funny old period, aren't we, in the UK in terms of local lockdowns and second wave of uh, coronavirus, etc. The state of play currently is this. Germany is exempt from the UK government's ban on all but essential travel, so that's good. In terms of the German side of things, high-risk areas only have to quarantine on arrival. I currently don't live in a, uh, in a high-risk area, so that's all good. But we do get the feeling that things are going to change uh, in the coming days or possibly hours. So. We really do feel like this is the last chance to get out to Germany and Porsche at Stuttgart, collect that car and bring that 959 back before Germany effectively closes its door to the Brits for a little while. So we'll crack on. Incidentally, we're getting the channel tunnel. We won't be allowed out of our vehicle at the time to remain COVID compliant during the journey. And then to ensure that we don't have to quarantine on arrival back in the UK, we're not stopping in France or Belgium. If we get out, it's game over, we've got a quarantine. So the car is fueled appropriately until Germany. I will not be having any fluids taken on board anytime soon. It's kind of it really. No stop till Deutschland. The Turbo S was a great choice for our trip, proving fast, but also comfortable for a jaunt through Europe. Leaving the car train in France, we soon hit Belgium then Holland by evening, and finally Germany by nightfall, en route to our overnight hotel in Cologne. The Turbo S demonstrating its dexterity with a commendable return of 31 mpg for the day, and that's over 620 kilometers of driving. Not bad for a 650 horsepower super sports car. It was time to hit the hay, for the morning would bring a plot twist in our bid to repatriate that 959. Okay, not long been up. Today's the 23rd of October. Just had some news delivered overnight essentially from the German government. It says from 11.01 p.m. British Standard Time on the 23rd of October today, the designated high risk areas of the UK will be extended to include the whole of the UK. I was currently in a low risk area. Um, anyone who's been in the designated high risk areas, i.e. in the UK full stop, in the two weeks prior to their arrival in Germany is required to proceed directly to their accommodation and quarantine for 14 days or until they can show evidence of a negative test result. Uh, those who can provide evidence of a negative test taken in the European Union member state, we are not in that anymore. Uh, it has to be less than 48 hours prior to arrival. So I either go off and find a test in Germany, which I'm absolutely not going to do, um, or I get out. So that is 11.01 p.m. British Standard Time tonight. That's actually technically a minute past midnight German time tomorrow. Uh, that is the day I leave. It feels a little bit like trying to escape a burning building at the moment, so we'll get the job done today and basically get out. Good job, got a Turbo S to do it in rather speedy fashion. Better get on, hey? 
The thing is, we had another mission to do first on arrival at Zuffenhausen, which you'll find out about in a series of future videos. Our agenda would mean we'd lose the entire day on Porsche Platz, though we did manage a quick visit to Porsche Classic HQ to retrieve the GOAT before losing light. The next morning, and on our last permitted day in Germany, we headed home via the country's famous autobahn, which allowed both cars to stretch their legs, if not quite to the 200 mile an hour they were capable of, mainly due to traffic and conditions. Okay, just outside Cologne, turned off the autobahn. My current steed so far, as you know, is there, the 992 Turbo S, which has been absolutely brilliant so far. However, obviously, the whole point of this trip really is to repatriate the 959. Paul, the owner, has very kindly asked if I would like to drive the car. Yes, I absolutely would, is the emphatic answer. So, a real pinch myself moment for me, we're gonna see what it's like to drive the legendary Porsche 959 on its home, the autobahn. Holy hell, it's going to take a little bit of time to fully acquaint myself with everything going on here. It's a little bit different to the 992 Turbo S, isn't it? But then in many ways it is the same as I shall elaborate on once we get out onto Das Autobahn. I actually cannot believe we're about to do this. Paul, if you are watching, thank you so much, my friend. Where's that curb? Very high biting point is the first observation. Oh! Right, this is it then. The 959 on the autobahn. You might think that because this car is, well, 34, 35 years old next year, that it doesn't share too much in common with that Turbo S behind. Well, actually, they've got quite a lot in common and more so than what first meets the eye. Yes, this has 450 horsepower, that's 650, but they're both four wheel drive, twin turbo charge, have PASM, um, active aerodynamics, if you count the front and rear axle lift on these things. Wet mode as well, this also has snow mode by the way, so it actually trumps the 992. But the history of the 959, I mean it's incredible isn't it? As we know, it was late, so much so it possibly, arguably, cost Helmut Bott his job and Petter Schutz as well was caught up in that, the CEO at the time, just because it ran on so much and cost the company so much money. But despite that acrimonious start to life, shall we say, I mean, the 959 has gone on to epitomise absolutely everything Porsche stands for in terms of uh, engineering integrity. It really is, and as I say, technology and uh, design principles of this car resonated for years to come. Design-wise, of course, in terms of the 993 with that more kind of rate headlight design, smoother front end. Technologically, most things have come through to the 992 generation today, haven't they? The full fascinating rollout of the 959's groundbreaking tech into other road-going 911s throughout the ensuing years is as follows. In 1989, the 964 got all-wheel drive and ABS. In 1995, the 993 Turbo adopted twin turbocharging and twin intercooling. In 1998, the 996 switched to a water-cooled flat six. Don't forget the 959 had water-cooled heads. And the 996 Turbo got hollow wheel spokes by the year 2000. The 997 of 2004, meanwhile, got PASM. And then the Gen 2 in 2009 adopted center lock wheels and tire pressure monitoring. It wasn't until the 991 GT3 RS of 2015 in which Porsche used magnesium for some body parts Though the 959's use of lightweight materials for its body, including Kevlar, spawned the use of carbon fibre on Rennsport models from the 996 onwards. 
And here's a pub fact for you. Look closely at the paint under the wing mirrors on the 959 and you'll see a slight fissure in its surface. This is the result of the mirror's weight bearing down on such a lightweight panel over time. Why was the 959 late? Well, because there were so many firsts for this car, the company had to develop a lot from scratch. For example, den locks, center lock wheels, complete new development for a road car. The company had to work with third parties as well, for example, Michelin to create tires that would see well past 200 mile an hour, but also run flat as well. Uh, Bilstein suspension uh, for the double suspension, wasn't it, all round. Again, it's a first for a road car, first for Porsche. This thing, I mean, this is incredible to drive this car in 2020. Imagine, imagine driving this in 1986. Boost. Christ, when that second turbo kicks in, this thing absolutely shifts. That's a key difference between a conventional turbocharged like Porsche in the turbo, of course, and the 959. It's in the 959, the turbos, well, it's a twin turbo, they are sequential. So you get the first turbo kicking in around 2000 RPM. The second turbo doesn't kick in until four and a half thousand RPM. And when it does, you get another almighty shunt forward. I have to say, this thing still feels really fast today. It's not ludicrous like the 992 Turbo is, and there definitely is lag, which is excellent. Put your foot down, you go one, two, and you're gone. Unless you sit at four and a half thousand RPM, then you really are at the start of that power band for that massive second turbo to kick in, and you're away. Don't forget, this is way before the years of variable turbine geometry in the Porsche 911 turbos, which basically gave the turbocharged 911s the best of both worlds in terms of smaller turbochargers for less lag, but then when the veins opened up, it gave the, uh, the equivalent of a larger turbocharger delivering more power. Of course, the 959, a car that many see rivaled the F40, certainly for outright speed as the fastest car in the world, before a certain roof CTR Yellowbird came along and put pay to that, but anyway, the 959 versus F40 debate is, uh, this is kind of nuts, isn't it? Where were we? Yes, the 959 versus F40 debate, perennial, isn't it, in automotive circles. You have to remember that although both were 200 mile an hour cars, which is an incredible achievement for a road car in 1986, the 959 did all of that with air conditioning, leather seats, a radio. So to my mind, although I had a poster of an F40 on my bedroom wall when I was growing up, the 959 usurps that in terms of its just engineering genius. We forget as well, don't we, that this was meant to be a car to homologate Porsche's Group B entry. Well, midway through creating this car, Group B ceased to exist. So Porsche had gone way down the line in terms of investment and R&D on a car that they could no longer go racing with anyway. What did they do instead? Well, they took it to Le Mans in the form of the 961. Yes, mate, you and me both, brother, you and me both. The 959 was finally ready in 1986, but as another hitch, Porsche couldn't sell the car in the USA. The reason is Porsche refused to give the car up to authorities for a crash test. I mean, this car cost so much money to make they sold the car allegedly at a loss. There was no way they were just gonna give one away for crash test purposes. The upshot was this, Porsche couldn't sell its most important car, arguably of its entire existence, in its most crucial market. It's a massive faux pas. There's that second turbo. There's the second turbo, 240, sweaty palms, wind noise, and brake. <laughs> ridiculous. Oh my god. 
Is this not every petrol head's dream? Driving the Porsche 959 on the Autobahn. Apologies if you think I'm getting kind of too excited, but I mean, this is just utterly ridiculous. I'm going to be dining out on this for a long, long time. I tell you that. I tell you what, that is unrelenting properly relentless. I have to say the brakes are absolutely awesome as the turbo goes on and we drop back. Let's go, 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 go. Four and a half, whoosh. Oh, the noise. Engine, flat six, obviously in the back where it should be in a 911. This is a 911, by the way. It's the Uber 911. It's the daddy and probably always will be. Photographers willing me on. You can actually see, if you look at the kind of silhouette of this car, particularly from the back, you can see 3.2 Carrera and then just cloaked in this just uber wide body. I definitely like a bit more reach on the steering and actually the steering wheel is in a slightly awkward position. That's kind of a uh, legacy of the G-Series, which was obviously in production when these cars were made. The five dials at first glance looks very 3.2964, but there are crucial changes. In the middle, you've got the boost bar, which of course was evident on the 911 Turbo anyway, but this goes up to 2.5 bar of boost. The far right video clock, that is where you've got your four wheel drive information in terms of disc lock at the rear, and then also the distribution between front and back. You've got the center console, which is kind of vaguely similar to what the 964 center console would end up looking like, but you've got your ride height adjustment, manually operable, and what would be kind of defined, I suppose, as active suspension management on the left. The shifter then on top of that, it kind of, yeah, reminds me of a G64 964 kind of style in the knob itself. Reverse is out on left, just like the G50 and the G64. It doesn't start with one though, it starts with G. Now that is essentially a terrain gear. So if you're on uneven terrain, you use that to get started. Then it goes one, which is a dog leg, two, three, four, five. The wheel itself reminds me of 3.2 Carrera. The difference being this says Porsche 959 across the horn. There are two versions of the 959. The Comfort, which is this, Comfort with a K, came with leather seats. There was also a sport version as well, the 959S. That came with cloth seats, a roll cage, and didn't have things like air conditioning or the ride height adjustment. That really was a hardcore track version of the 959. How many made? I believe 338, we'll have to check that. Most of them were 1986 to 1988. There were eight or nine made in around about 1992. Porsche had to build 200 models to homologate the 959 for Group B. In the end, it built 337, 29 of which were sport versions. The Comfort sold for 420,000 Deutschmarks, which was loss making, with Helmut Bott at the time calling it the most expensive promotional giveaway that Porsche had ever offered its customers. In 1992, a further nine comforts were made from Porsche's considerable spare parts bin. Four were in red, three in silver, and two in black, though all of these came with black leather interiors rather than the triple colouring of the first batch. These batch two cars sold for nearly 750,000 Deutschmarks, which was the current market rate of the time. Today, you'll need at least a million quid to bag yourself one of these Uber 911s. The legacy of this car is so far reaching within Zuffenhausen. This really is, never mind the ultimate 911, this is the ultimate road going Porsche. And it's my absolute privilege to say I have driven it. That is outrageous. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Paul, thank you so much for letting me drive this car. Outrageous. Absolutely outrageous. What a car. It's my pleasure to bring this sort of visual editorial your way and share these amazing moments with you. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, importantly, to make sure you do not miss out on more crazy 911-based shenanigans such as this.